Welcome to the Compliance 911 Show, a no nonsense podcast discussing hot topics for today's busy compliance professional. It's everything you wanted to know about regulatory compliance, but we're afraid to ask. And now, here are your hosts, Dean Stockford of M&M Consulting and Len Suzio of Geodata Vision. Welcome to our podcast series addressing everything you wanted to know about regulatory compliance, but were afraid to ask. Dean, it's great to see you again and a happy new year to you and your family. It's hard to believe we are working on our 68th and 69th episodes today. So what interesting topic did you bring to the table to kick off 2024? Len, it's great to see you and happy new year. It sounds like your uh, throat is holding on or your voice, I should say, is holding on. I know you've been uh, knee deep in CRA uh, lately and talking a lot. So I'm, I'm glad to see your your uh, voice is still hanging on with us today. Mm-hmm. But uh, before I jumped in today's topic, Len, I just wanted to to take a minute and just bring our audience up to speed on some important topics that, of course, both of us have been collaborating on and are prepared for in, in 2024. Without without saying too much, uh, <laughs> the CRA final rule. You know, we're working on uh, some recordings as we just uh, uh, talked about before before our podcast recording today. That will be similar to the podcast in in, in many regards. Uh, that will break down the CRA rule. Uh, we're also looking into some uh, perhaps maybe what I call roadshows or workshops per se. Nothing final yet, but we're talking about it. So I just wanted folks to know. And uh, we want to ensure that everyone is able to unpack that over 1,500 pages of new regulations if there is uh, such a thing. I know that uh, you and I have gone back and forth on this already, and it's uh, it's just absolutely unbelievable and convoluted. So I'll, I'll leave it mm-hmm. there. 1071, that still has not gone away, although a lot of people think it has. It hasn't. We continue to get requests for training and consulting. So in our opinion, this will be implemented. It's just a matter of when and how and what it will look like. Fair lending, uh, another area that continues to attract attention by the regulators uh, with that redlining initiative. And we have newer mapping software through Geodata Vision and and have experience with the REMA concept, which is really the, the area that regulators have been uh, honing in on for redlining uh, reasons. So mm-hmm. again, we're working on that and we've got a lot going on. So we have great mapping software through Geodata Vision and I would encourage folks to reach out. And then last but not least is the climate risk. And we continue to see regulators, uh, while there are no regulations, uh, stepping up their efforts on institutions to at least assess the physical risks associated with their assets. So more demands will be coming. I think we're, we're going to see, and we already are seeing, a request for a climate risks assessments and data analysis. So once again, I would encourage folks to reach out to Geodata Vision or M&M Consulting because we have experience in all of these categories and would be more than happy to assist in any way we can. So that's just to sum it up a little bit, Len. <laughs> well, I think that's a great re- recap of what the big regulatory compliance issues are and will be for 2024. I know we both have been working hard in these areas, and I'm glad you mentioned this to our audience to kind of recap the hot regulatory compliance issues for 2024 that we are going to be focusing on for this webinar and at this podcast and other podcasts coming up. Yeah, correct. These are very hot areas and were certainly worth mentioning. But let's jump into today's topic. Uh, uh, electronic funds transfers and investigations is what I'm going to talk about. Boy, you did pick a hot topic for today, Dean, because the 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 previous podcast we had about EFT had some of the highest downloads for our entire podcast series so far. So I'm excited and very positive to hear that you have some more to say about that hot topic today. Yeah. And today I'm going to talk about, and thank you for that, Len. And we're going to talk more about the investigative process just briefly in the time, very, very strict time frames for doing so. The Electronic Funds Transfer Act establishes basic rights and liabilities and responsibilities of consumers who use electronic funds transfer, remitted, remittance transfer services, and of financial institutions or other persons that offer these services. The primary objective of the act itself is that this part is, is the, the protection of the individual consumers that are engaged or engaging in electronic funds transfers and remittance transfers. It also provides consumers with a process to dispute any unauthorized, 
incorrect or fraudulent transactions. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on that investigative process overall. Often what we see, Len, is institutions delay the starting of the investigation of a dispute for various reasons, such as lack of information or no, no formal written notification of error. And these delays can, can get the financial institution in a lot of hot water. So in order for a consumer to dispute an EFT, they first need to notify the institution with a little bit of emphasis added here, orally or in writing of the era and, incl- and include the, the name of the consumer, the account number, and a description of why the consumer believes there is an error. That's all that's needed in order to initiate an error resolution request. The institution can re- request additional information such as dates and amounts. However, the institution receives notice, a notice that includes the above bullet points, then that is considered sufficient information in order to uh, uh, start the error process. And it's very important. It's a very important part of the process as the regulation includes very strict time limits uh, when the institution actually receives notice and then allows some flexibility once they've received that notice as to how long it will take them to resolve a particular error and they can extend those time frames under certain s- circumstances. Uh, just a word of caution though, Institutions often require written notice of an error or an affidavit to begin the investigation. So it's often non compliant as far as timing is concerned. And, and if that is the process, then it, it's flawed because uh, we have to start, as I just talked about, uh, once we received either orally or in writing the three pieces of information above. So although the institution may request a written statement or an affidavit, which is okay to do, Uh, the investigation itself has to start, regardless of whether the consumer provides one of those affidavits or a written statement. Again, the process has to start if the three pieces have been received uh, above that I spoke of. The only caveat between the notice in writing or not is with what they call provisional credit. And so institutions do not have to provide provisional credit if it requires by policy written notice of error, and does not receive it within 10 business days of the initial oral notification. And the reason why I say that is because you have actually 10 days uh, to complete the investigation. However, we can extend those timeframes as I indicated before, and I'll get into that in just a minute. I don't want to get, as I always say, Len, too far over my skis. (laughs) (laughs) Well, spoken from a guy from Maine. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, this is great advice, but I want to make sure I understand correctly, Dean. Institutions have 10 business days to investigate an error, correct? Yeah, you're par- well, yes, and I'll say you're partially accurate. So institutions have 10 business days, and I always have to make sure I remind myself of business mm. days and, 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 and make sure folks look at the definition of business days because it could be different from regulation to regulation. So you want to make sure you take a look at what the business day is. So you have uh, 10 business days to investigate unless they cannot complete it within that 10-day period. If they're unable to complete it in that uh, 10-day period, then they can extend it up to 45 days if they provide the provisional credit. And as I just uh, talked about, the caveat relative to in writing or not in writing. So they that would extend it if they provided the provisional credit that extends it beyond the 10 business days. And then the investigative process starts. Inform the consumer within two business days after the provisional crediting of the amount in date of the provisional crediting. Give the consumer full use of their funds. So they have disputed items. So we're giving them full use of those funds provisionally credited during that investigative process. And then correct the error if there is one within one business day after determining an error actually occurred. And then we have to report those results to the consumer within three business days after completing the investigation. So you can see it's it's rather rather (laughs) onerous and very, very uh, strict with respect to timing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this time period can can be extended as well to 90 business days uh, for point of sale debit card transactions in foreign initiated transactions or occurred within 30 days of the initial deposit to the account if you are, again, provisionally crediting the customer's account, including interest where applicable, unless the customer does not provide that requested written confirmation within 10 days 
of an oral notice of error, as I indicated before, inform the consumer within two business days after the provisional crediting of the amount in the date of the provisional credit, give that consumer full use of the funds provisionally credited during that process, the investigative process, uh, correct the error if there is one within one business day after determining the error occurred, and again, report the results to the consumer within three business days after completing the investigation. So circling back around, as I indicated before, you have really two time frames or three. If you can't complete it within the 10 business days, you can extend it out to 45 business days. And then, of course, there was also the 90 business days for POS, debit card, and foreign initiated transactions. This is very interesting stuff, Dean. And I certainly didn't realize how strict the timeframes are. I also didn't realize how beneficial these uh, rules are to consumers. So on behalf of our audience, I want to say thank you for highlighting these provisions today. Do you have any parting words for our audience today? Yeah. And, and as always, of course, make sure that you you know understand uh, your institution's process. I think it's important to review your policy. What is your policy? Know how, where, and who is charged with uh, processing these error resolution uh, requests or error assertions within the bank or, or credit union. And then uh, know that what they call P2P, which is person-to-person -person payments, are covered by Reg E and error resolution processes. So, you know, good luck to folks. And again, revisit these requirements. It's very imperative. Timing is critical. Great advice, Dean. And I'm sure our audience today appreciated the insight you have provided. Thanks, Len. This is Dean Stockford from m and Consulting. And this is Len Susio from GeoDataVision saying thank you for listening to today's topic. And please let us know of additional topics you would like to hear in future podcast episodes. Thanks for listening to the Compliance 911 Show. If you like the podcast, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. While you're at it, please give us a like and review to help others find the show. As always, links are in the show notes, and you can always find us online at compliance911show.com. Follow m and Consulting and Geo Data Vision on LinkedIn for all the latest news and information on compliance hot topics.